start. So my name is Rachel Hannity. Um, I'm the education librarian here at UTSA, and I'm super excited about tonight. I'm super excited you guys are here. Um, this is going to be a wonderful learning and teaching experience um, for all of us, especially at this time of year. It's going to be fabulous. Um, I have the distinct pleasure of introducing Dr. Christensen. Um, Dr. Clark is on her way. Um, she is caught in some really horrible traffic, but she is going to be here as soon as she can. I am going to go ahead and introduce her, um, and then you all will get to meet her shortly thereafter. So, um, I'm going to talk about Dr. Christensen. Dr. M. Siduri Christensen is an assistant professor of TESOL, Applied Linguistics, and the Bicultural and Bilingual Studies Department here at UTSA. She's a former Fulbright Scholar and a Department of State English Language Specialist. She specializes in the research and teaching of sociolinguists and digital literacies among transnational bilinguals and English language learners. Her research explores the intersection between digital literacy and language ideologies, identities, and the culture in offline and online social network environments. She's pretty awesome. Her publications have appeared in journals such as the Journal of Social Linguists, the International Journal of Bilingual Education and Bilingualism, and System. She regularly performs Mexican folklorico dancing and participates in cultural events around San Antonio. The goal of her overall research is to explore the way people manifest their cultures and identities through language. So y'all are in a real treat to hear from her this evening. I'm also going to introduce Dr. Ellen Rojas Clark. She's a San Antonio native and the Professor Emerita in Bilingual and Bicultural Studies here at UTSA. She developed multimedia projects and worked with teachers and so school communities with Maya and Miguel, a PBS animated series. She's the producer for the Latino Artists Speak series and other documentaries. Her academic publications include five textbooks, over 100 journal publications, and three cultural books dealing with bicultural bilingual subject matter. Popular publications include Tamales, Comadres, and Other Meaning of Civilization, Don Moyosas Espanol y Castillo y Sus Calaveras, and Our Daily Pandos, Mexican Pastries, which is currently under review. In addition, she received her BA in elementary ed education here at Trinity University, or at Trinity University here in San Antonio, sorry, man. Um, she has an MA in bicultural and bilingual studies from UTSA and a PhD in curriculum instruction from the University of Austin. Uh, we're just so very fortunate to have such wonderful speakers. And without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Dr. Christensen. Thank you. Thank you. I need to know if I will have to be spoiler alert or not. Who has not watched Coco? All right, so be careful <laughs> to that. So uh, just for those of you who are interested, um, you can just kind of like point a picture of your camera phone in here, and you will have access to the presentation. There are going to be a couple of videos that I want to be showing, but if you want to reference to the videos later, you can do so. Um, by grabbing the link. And so, uh, thank you very much for the invitation uh, to the JPA Library. I'm very happy to talk about this topic. It's one of the uh, topics that I feel very excited about. Um, like introduction said, I'm into folkloric dancing, folkloric things and culture, and that's what I do for the research. And so, talking about this topic is something that um, I'm very passionate about. So, I might not finish my presentation because <laughs> I have so much to say. And please, at any point, if you have any questions, uh, comments, uh, something that relates to you, please uh, don't hesitate uh, to raise your hand and, and share with us. Uh, part of my presentation is going to have trivia questions. If you get the question right, you'll receive a surprise. And it's going to be a treat. I can guarantee that. All right, so to begin with, um, I have a picture here. What is this? So starting with the questions and the trivia, don't be afraid. This, you don't get a prize or anything. <laughs> so what is this? It's an ofrenda natal for Day of the Dead. And uh, do, do we see something a little different from what we see in the ofrendas or altares of nowadays? 
Yeah, what else? So what, what do we have? What elements of this do you recognize in the current ofrendas or the altars that are put up now for Day of the Dead? Petals of flowers? That's good. Anything else? Fruit, yeah? The skulls, right? That's uh, very important. And so we see that there are some elements that, uh, even from the indigenous times, you know, that were part of this celebration, Day of the Dead. And Day of the Dead, like the introduction said, and actually the signs um, say, is not uh, something that is contemporary, right? It, it dates from a number of years. And the one thing that I want to point out is that it is from different cultures in Mexico. It's not just one. It's not just the Mexicas or the Aztecs. That this is actually an Aztec one. But also the Maya people would celebrate Day of the Dead, and the Totonacos were the part where I'm from. I'm biased, by the way. <laughs> it's going to be on that side of Mexico. I'm from Veracruz, so the way we celebrate is completely different. But there are some elements that are common, right? And we can see those elements that you uh, rightly point out. And um, this is kind of the center of the session. We saw some of you pointed at the food, uh, some of you pointed at the petals, and um, there are other th things in here. We have a cross. And you're going to say, okay, what does that mean? Is this a cross, like, you know, Christian cross? Or is it? At this point, the cross symbolizes just the cardinal, north, south, east, and west. It has nothing to do with a cross uh, that has a religious uh, symbol, at least not like the Christianity symbol. And what does this tell us about the current, current ofrendas? You know, we keep some of these elements, but we have certainly added new elements to these ofrendas, right? And so we have that. The other thing is uh, it is ground level that somebody pointed out. It's not on stages like we usually see it, kind of like on a, on a table or, or different layers. Uh, it's all on the ground because it's uh, the connection to the earth and also the grains. Everything is food, is what the grain, the grains um, that are from the earth, right? It's that connection to the, to the earth. We see the cactus here, um, very symbolic of Mexico. And then we see um, the skeletons that are like real skeletons of people, which is something that we don't see nowadays, right? So. A lot of times, and these are um, examples of people exhumating, um, exhumating these bones where uh, that was part of the tradition, is part of living with the death. The death is not a scary thing then, or it was not a scary thing back then. It's not something to fear. It's not something to, yeah, that, that is going to come like spooky and get us, right? It's, it's something, it's part of us. It's, it's continuation of life. And so, some people still have that tradition where they would actually get the bones and clean them and then put them back in the tombs um, and go on with their lives. And that's part of like what this represents. Because cultures change, right? Societies change and what was uh, usually done at one point is not done, you know, at another point. So we have that and then so what is the symbolism of all of these? So the talk, the, the title of my talk is that syncretism, symbolism, and the pluriculturalism in uh, this celebration. Because nothing, even back then, because I, I haven't gone even before then, I don't know what things were merged, right, to celebrate something in the way that at that time was celebrated. But at this time where we are, well, we can trace some of these symbols that came from, again, the Mexicas, uh, the Mayan, like the indigenous people. And we have that compass that I was telling you about. Uh, this is another type of uh, ofrenda. It's also on the ground. It doesn't have the levels. And it's full of the petals and the food, right? Typical food of Mexico, by the way. These are the tuna. Uh, it's called tuna, not tuna the fish. Uh, what do they call it? Pli prickly pears. I've seen it on the HEB. They're expensive. They're don't bother to buy them. Um, but uh, you know the the foods, the grains. You know, like the beans and then uh, the flowers. We have uh, flor de león. I don't know what's called. Um, and then the sempa sushi. And then we have the earth uh, and the sempa sushi, which was the way that the, 
that the dead will find the way into the ofrendas, right? So you might think, oh, it's the smell, maybe it's the, the color. I don't know what it was. I really don't know that, but that's the way that they would get to the ofrenda. And then we have Mictlan. Mictlan is the place where the dead people will go. It's this other world. Um, let's not talk about the movie because some of you have not watched it. All right, and then uh, Xolotl, which was the deity for the Mexicas, the Aztecs, the Mexicas, um, the, um, actually Xolotl is the god. The dog is like it's one of the representations and the one that helps people go into the journey from like our world to Mictlan. And so those are all symbols that if you think about it, um, well, they're very important, but they're still going on in today's um, altars and celebrations. And then, well, until now, it's just all indigenous talk. I, I talked a little bit of the Mayas. I talked about a little bit of the Mexicas. And then colonization came. And with that came a whole new bunch of things. So remember the altar that I showed you that was the indigenous one? Can you tell the differences between that one and this one? So what are some of the differences? Hmm? Candles, right. So with Christianity, especially Catholicism, came the light, right? Catholicism tradition, and um, actually the sign even says that, you know, Halloween and all spooky, the light is a big deal, right? Because the, the other world, the, the Mictlan, I don't know, like, the heaven and, and um, hell and anyway, the, the way to get to heaven is light. And so bringing that light aspect um, was something that was adopted um, to this ofrenda. So what else besides the light do we see here that is new? Hmm? The size, they're not, uh, and they're not just on the ground, right? Uh, in, they're in the graveyard in here. What else? There is no food here. Well, the, we can assume there is something in here. We don't know what it is, but. All right. And so the path with the flowers. What are the flowers doing here? And the first one is, was, it was the path, you know, how the dead will find the altar to go and eat the food and, and be there. And now the lights take the place of that, right? But the flowers are still there. And where are the flowers? What are they doing? Hmm? Decorating. Yeah, definitely. And do you see them over here? With a cross? And now that doesn't look like the cardinals, right? Like the north, south. What kind of cross is that? Yeah, so we start seeing like a little bit of that syncretism with the two cultures. Uh, not just cultures, but religions, right? And so we see that uh, it changes. And um, did we see any human bones? No. Why? Because those are scary, remember? <laughs> those are going to come and get you. And so a representation or in lieu of, or in, you know, in place of those bones, of people say, well, we can still, you know, do them, but now we're going to put them in bread. Was there bread in the indigenous time? No. Wheat was brought, right? So this is completely new. And they said, well, we can make them into shapes with the bones. This is not as threatening, right? And we put the candle just in case. And we make them fun and colorful. And still, we do recognize they're there. And they're still there. Um, they did not disappear. Um, yeah, there must be saying, you know, they didn't disappear. but. Of course, it's not gonna. The culture is not gonna die. It's gonna evolve. It's going to fuse and evolve. Okay. So, um, what about the food and the indigenous deity? Yes. Oh, thank you. So, in here we can see that um, the deity is gone. We have now replaced with the crosses and the saints and other things that are from Catholicism, and we have. And of course, the food is uh, already kind of like a mixture of both. There was no rice right before, but now there is, and it's actually, you know, I could never eat mole without rice. Because, yeah, I'm not from that time. 
And so then the schools then became the symbol, right, of life, but they were not completely taken out when the Spanish came and tried to colonize and, and tried to evangelize a lot of indigenous groups. Um, instead, this lived on. And what we know as the Katrina, you know, the symbol of the Katrina, was actually, um, did not start that way. So this is a um, satire that was done uh, for people that would maybe believe they're Spanish, even though they're not Spanish. Um, and it's kind of like a remembrance that no matter how much or how much jewelry you have, how much money, how you dress, you're going to end up looking the same way. So it is a satire that then Diego Rivera, uh, this is called like, uh, Calavera Garbancera uh, by Jose Guadalupe Posada. And then Diego Rivera actually um, baptized it as Katrina. And that's a Katrina that we know nowadays that everybody loves. Some people are obsessed. <laughs> Me too, <laughs> with these Katrinas. And there are different depictions. This is a Diego Rivera mural um, and figures, and now you see them on the streets and whatnot. But uh, the satire did not just continue with the Katrinas. These are the Calavera Literaria, so when you have the chance, please read it. I love this one about our president. Um, so I'm not going to go into that. <laughs> <laughs> it is fun. Please read them later. Uh, and then we have, uh, you know, other satirization without the Katrinas. And this is, for example, uh, in Chantolo, which is a, a, a carnival, carnival-like uh, celebration similar to the Day of the Dead that happens in La Huasteca, which is the east side of Mexico, where I'm, where I'm, I'm from. People actually wear masks and dance. It's like a parade, a carnival. And, and that's all people do because it's a satire. What happens is they use, the Spanish use this type of, of parades to indoctrinate uh, the indigenous. But what they did was actually satirize them, dressed up as what the Spanish will fear or how would the Spanish will like, uh, look like and actually make fun of them. And these celebrations stayed on. Uh, if you have time, please watch the video. This is some, not something that is done widely in Mexico. It's just that particular um, side. So what is up with Halloween? A lot of people saying, is it taking over? Is it destroying um, all of this culture and, and you know the richness of it? And we can see, I put some pictures that I thought depicted Halloween very well, at least the way I see it. So it's like the masks and the spiders. I love spiders. I don't think they're scary, but anyway, <laughs> some people like, actually are scared. Um, but what are people doing? And so now we see something like this. People repurposing what it is, mixing, again, you know, one side with the other. This Katrina doesn't look particularly happy or part of a parade, right? Uh, yet she's colorful. Um, and this is part of that syncretism. The symbolism still goes on, uh, but now it's a mixture of the two. And I'm gonna go a little bit faster because the other speaker just got here. Um, people dress up now like a Katrina, something that did not happen even when I was a child. You did not see that very often. Um, people did not dress up as anything unless you were in Chantolo wearing those devil masks and stuff, making fun of the Spanish people, right? Um, and now it's not making fun of the Spanish people, but the colonizers. Um, and so there are items or things that have been adopted in both sides. In here, in Halloween, how do we see people dress up for Halloween? And now it's not scary anymore. And many times they just take day of the dead things and, and use that as their costume to go trick or treating in Mexico is the same thing. So there is syncretism happening in the US, but also in Mexico. And uh, I am going to take a couple of more minutes because I do want to give my giveaways. So uh, when is the day of the dead celebrated? November 2nd, okay, she gets a prize. Um, is that the only day celebrated? No. November 1st, okay, she gets a prize too. They'll give you the prices. Uh, when do the dead people arrive? On the second? Only? On the first. All right. 
So the tradition is that this celebration spans five or six days, in some places even seven days. The thing is that when the Spanish came, said, oh, well, this is actually like an all-day saint, so we're going to put it together and we're just going to celebrate the one day. But actually, there are all of those days that we celebrate. We start putting the altars as soon as the 25th of October. And we don't stop until the second, just because of the Spanish, I guess. But they come all the time. <laughs> so they keep coming, and we have to keep the altars with food and parties, and you picture it. The next one, when did the day of the death parade? Because now there are huge parades. Like the one in Mexico City started. Mm -hmm. Was it after the James Bond movie? <laughs> okay, he gets one. <laughs> Show what it is. It's like a, it's a UTSA papel picado thing. I'll, I can't go into the symbolism of that. But yeah, a lot of people say, well, this is how Mexicans celebrate Day of the Dead. Actually, not at all. It was James Bond movie right here. I cannot, I, I didn't even watch it. I didn't go and, and I, I guess I did watch it, but I didn't notice. So they needed a scene where it was scary and they were there and, and so they put this parade together. And they decided to make it and, and come on, like this is how they celebrate Day of the Dead. After that, the mayor thought, oh, this is a great touristic idea. So we're gonna get a lot of money from whom? You guess. So. We're going to make a Day of the Dead parade, but you see the differences between this Day of the Dead, which is, again, scary, spooky, kind of like Halloween-y, and this is how Mexicans celebrate it. So it's a repurposing of that, um, you know, the symbols and, and the culture that, well, they might take the idea, it might be their idea, but it's not their culture in a way. So, back to Coco very quickly, because I don't have enough time. So what's up with Coco? Disclaimer, I love the movie. No spoilers. But I used a lot of tissues. Well done. But, <laughs> well done in terms of storytelling, cinematography, and what do I know about Pixar animations? I think it's amazing. Music, oh my gosh. And if you have the opportunity to watch it in Mexican Spanish, man, they did do a good job. So who did I say was uh, Xolotl? Okay, do you have a prize yet? Okay, you get one. <laughs> so yes, the Aztec Day of the Dead. This is how it's depicted. But what has happened now? So it went from a deity to something decorative to put in the altars to a symbol of Mexican pride in, like for the city of Mexico is like the symbol of Mexico, to this. <laughs> I will let you think about it when you watch the movie. And what does that do to the changes? Like how, how does that change the way we see what was supposed to be an indigenous deity, right? All right, how about portraits? Um, think about what the movie says about the portraits, and if you don't have the portrait of a loved one, what happens to them? My question is what happened when there was no photography? Right. <laughs> so, yeah, and what about the food, right? So, um, I have this meme for those of you who speak Spanish, enjoy it. For those of you who don't speak Spanish, what this means is one skeleton is on the other. I never told anyone that I was vegan. Why do they always put bread and fruit in my altars? I like tacos. That's because that's kind of left out. Again, it's kind of changed. The symbolism is there, but it's kind of uh, different. So, Last one, and I'm glad that you guys put them here. What are these alebrijes? Anybody knows? Ah, you don't get anything. <laughs> ah, but okay, fine. Share, share with them. Yes. Hmm? Mythological creatures. When were they invented? Are they indigenous? If they are, what type of indigenous group did make them? They're modern, right? So for those of you who said modern, raise your hand, you get a prize. Yeah, back there, back there. 
So you get a price. They're modern, right? They're like from the 80s, this guy. Anyway, go in there. I have a link on how they are. And so how does Coco repurpose them? So think about that. And if they had nothing to do with the death, if they have nothing to do with the celebration, why are they in this movie? So what happens now, Dante, is this. And I have a few slides that I'm, I won't have time because they're asking me to stop. And I told you I can talk about this for days and days. But watch the videos. It's different celebrations in Mexico, the way that people do them. I put a before and after, kind of like before the James Bond thing and Halloween took off and the after. Um, and the representations. Uh, if you want to see Coco Inspired, that does exist. And then finally, to close up, um, after you watch Coco and think about at least these elements and the symbolic elements of Coco, not that I'm saying, I mean, Coco is not horrible, but I mean, in the sense of like cultural syncretism, syncretism is going to happen. Actually, we don't even know that what the Aztecs or, you know, the Totonacos did was any type of syncretism with other cultures. I just don't know that. I haven't gone that far. But I put these two videos to show how, for example, the same thing can be represented from the different set of eyes, Mexican eyes and non-Mexican eyes. So is Coco good, bad? Um, no, it's different. A lot of people ask me, so are you against it? No, I'm not against it. Look, this is how I celebrate in Mexico. Just the old-fashioned way. I don't dress up as Katrina there. Young people do it. I don't, because I didn't grow up with that. But here, hey, I just participated in the Day of the Dead, and I'm dancing here with my um, colleague. We're dancing for the Guadalupe on Friday, so. That's it. Enjoy the movie, and thank you. Sorry, I <laughs> have questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Christensen. And um, Dr. Clark is here. Um, and we're going to, the other thing I wanted to say, everything that Dr. Christensen has said, we are, we did videotape and we are going to have her presentation online. So you're more than welcome <coughs> to come back and look at that. Um, and we're going to put up Dr. Clark's presentation. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Christensen. It was amazing. That was so, so wonderful. Um, all right, here we go. Here's Dr. Clark. Buenas tardes, buenas noches. Welcome to La Catrinas, Los Catrines, Dia de Muertos, and Day of the Dead. And she's from Mexico City. I'm from San Antonio. I was born here and I'm going to die here. And I just dressed up with my face painted and my mask on Saturday at the big Catrina Ball here in San Antonio. So I'm going to tell you in a while, and you're going to pull out your, your um, pencils to write down all of the events that are happening in San Antonio with the people she talked about that made that James Bond movie. So Dia de los Muertos, and it really is Dia de Muertos. So if you want to be correct, just say Dia de Muertos. It is not Dia de los Muertos, because that is a literal translation of the English of Day of the Dead. So anyway, who's doing the... Donna, you can... Just, yeah. You know what, I have one, only one eye and I can't see on my left, so I'll just do it, okay? Thank you. Okay, you did the first one? Okay, so it's just an overview. I'm really not going to go over this because she was so good in giving you the background, the history, and the rationale for why to, why to do the de los Muertos. But what we do know, it is not a sad day. It's a happy day. I think that is so neat. It's really celebrated by all cultures throughout the world in a way of always remembering those that went before us. So she already told you what were the days to celebrate? The first and the second, and they do come before them. It's a long, long way from the afterworld, right? And um, she told you about the fact that it is a fusion of Catholicism and the indigenous belief system. Now, I'm not Catholic. I'm Methodist. And my family's been Methodist for four generations or more. But 
it is not a, cult, a religious celebration for me, it's a cultural one. Because it's a cultural and historical one that we celebrate who has passed on before this. So what is important for you to know, very important, it has to do with our identity, with who we are. So our culture gives us a vivaciousness. It gives us authenticity. It gives us a uniqueness. So the more you know about who you are and why you are, it makes you stronger as an individual, doesn't it? If you know who you are and you can talk about it, it gives you strength. So, oh, I can see it back there. I don't have to turn around. Duh. Okay. <laughs> I was trying to turn it around and look. So this is just a review of what she said earlier, right? The fact that, that the Aztecs and the Wallace saw it as a natural part of life, cyclical, and actually they believed that while you were alive, you were really asleep, and the day you died is the day you woke up. Isn't that kind of interesting, really? Really, really the reverse of what we've always thought. So that's why I think it's important for our families to believe that on these two days, we can evoke the spirits of the people that went before us so that we can then understand who they are. So what are the traditions? What's the name of the flowers? What, what? Sempatuchis, right. We know them as marigolds, but it's really Sempatuchi. And do you know what? Do you know that China and Peru now sell more marigolds than Mexico does. Oh, amazing, isn't it? And so we also know the calacas, which are what? Skeletons. <laughs> what are calacas? Skeletons. Skeletons, right. And so sometimes here, and especially in Mexico, you see the small little sugar skulls. And so there's a whole wonderful art form that is done with sugar. And out of the sugar, they form little, little seeds, they form skulls, they form food, they form all sorts of things. And also that they do the papel picado, which is what? What is a papel picado? Y'all just got the prizes. Somebody hold it up, please. OK, that's papel picado. And all it is is punched paper. Did she tell you how to do that? I mean, it's amazing. They have a stack of tissue paper this thick, and the tissue paper is so thin, and they punch it. And they make all of these figures and letters and so forth, that it's incredible. And the other thing you do during these days is that you're dressed up. By the way, I didn't dress up. This is the way what I wear every day, <laughs> because I like loose stuff that hides fat, OK? <laughs> and, um, and we have processions. And we have decorated graves. Isn't that beautiful? So people go out to the cemetery and clean up the graves of their ancestors and their parents and their grandparents. They eat lunch there, dinner, they have music. It's really wonderful. You say, oh, that's nice, it happens in Mexico. Hey, you know what? It happens in San Antonio. So if you go down on 24th and General McMullen, the San Fernando, San Fernando Cemetery, you will see it full of people full of flowers, full of music, because this is what we do naturally. It is not just a um, holiday thing that we do. We do it because it's part of who we are. So families go out to the cemeteries, clean up the cemeteries, and celebrate there. And of course, we have special food, music, and altars. So how do you create an altar and all of you? should go back to your dorm and do an altar. All you need is a raised table or something. It can be on top of your, your dresser or whatever you call it, where you put all your clothes, yeah, a, a dresser. And you put pictures up. You put candles up. You put a few flowers. I mean, you can do it. And then just say the most important thing are to have several items. One is you've got to have pictures of those that have gone on before you, and you've got to have their names. 
That's the most important thing because you've got to say the name. The day that you do no longer remember the name of your grandmother, your mother, or whoever went on before you, or your first dog, that person or concept is gone forever. Wow, right? So, what you do when you say that name out loud means that you're bringing and evoking those people that went on before you. Because, you know, you, weren't, you aren't, aren't alone. So, you need some elements. The elements are that you want to have things that represent Earth. So, what would represent Earth? Food, anything that grows in the earth, in la tierra. So any kind of food that, that is grown. You need to have wind. What represents wind? Babel Picasso, yeah, that's right. I'm not going to give you any, because you know what I brought? I brought real food, okay? <laughs> so you're going to get a bite of some food later on. So Babel Picasso, because it's so light and waves in the wind, makes wind. So that represents a wind. Fire is represented by what? Candles, exactly. And um, so you need water, because if you come back from the afterworld, it's gonna be, you're gonna be a little thirsty, right? So you need the water to replenish, and salt also to replenish the bodies. And then another nice touch, that you, those are the elements. You don't have to have anything else except pictures, names, and those things that represent what I just told you. But you should have something like, like maybe some incense, something that'll give that, that great smell of the Catholic churches. That's why I love Catholic churches, because they always smell so wonderful. So th that's a traditional one in um, Mexico. These are altares in San Antonio, alive and well. The one on the extreme right with the Virgen de Guadalupe is the one at my house that we just put up. It took us maybe half an hour, had tons of people over at the house, so we just quickly, I just sent them out on a scavenger hunt, go through the house and find things and bring them back and we made our outfit. The one in the middle is the one that, a committee that I um, organized called the Latino Leadership for the Library, Elta III, is the one that's in the middle. It took that, that, that one took about three months because we made all the figurines. And this one is an honor, the one in the middle, is an honor of Pedro Huizal, who um, designed the rose window at, at San Jose Mission. And he is declaring his love to his sweetheart there. And the one on, I guess it's the one on yeah. left. That one, have y'all heard of the Frutaria? The restaurant, the Fruteria, the, the La Gloria, all of those restaurants, they're owned by Chef Johnny Hernandez. That one is in Johnny Hernandez's house. Isn't that tremendous? It's really fantastic. So San Antonio is alive and well. This one is an altar of just pan de muertos. What's pan? Bread. So bread for the dead in Oaxaca. If I had enlarged that picture, you could see all of the different breads on there. And I'm really going to focus on pan de muertos for today. Guess why? I'm writing a book. It'll be published out next year. Will be published next year on pan, pan dulce, or Mexican sweet bread. And I have 2,000. I mean, there's over 2,000 names of pan dulce, of the different types of bread. In the book, I'll have 1,100. But if you go to a panaderia in San Antonio, or even in Mexico, you're not going to find a thousand different kinds of breads. You're probably going to find in Mexico maybe, maybe 50 different kinds. So the purpose of what am I doing this was I didn't want the concept to die. So for example, there's some breads that are called nalgas. Do you know what nalgas are? <laughs> Butts. So I guess that one is kind of went out of usage. There's, but there's body parts. I've classified them into body parts, gestures, all sorts of things. So pan dulce is a big, big deal in, um, in Mexico. So here's a pan dulce that we use for altares. The one on, on the left is um, a general 
kind of fun dulce that you find at banaderias or bakeries, Mexican bakeries. You'll see the ones that look like a shell. Those are called what? Ronchas and a variety of different ones. And one in the middle is a very fancy um, pan de muertos that has, can you tell what it has on the sides? Skulls. It's, well, it has bones. So those four things on it are bones. And what's in the middle? The round thing that looks like the head. And the one on the right are now the new kind of pan dulce, which is made in the figure of, of a figure. It's made in the figure of a figure. So now, the Bedoy Bakery in San Antonio makes these, this is a small one, but they make them that big. And you make them to resemble people who have died. Five years ago, hmm, Bedoy made one in my image. Big hair, glasses, and a wee feet. What I wear call wee feelets. And everybody kept going in there and saying, I want one that looks like Dr. Clark. I said, just a moment. You only do them when they die, so wait till I die before you do one in, in my image. I won't let you eat this one because this one's been on my altar for about three days. It's a little, getting a little hard. But you will taste, you will taste these. And these are the ones that have, you can just pass it around, that have the, the skull and the little head on them. And it's really just a yeast spread that's decorated with colored sugar. Don't eat it now, we'll divide it up, okay? <laughs> and um, where did I, I just put that? Okay. And so now you have sugar skulls. The ones on the, on the left are the ones made out of sugar. And yes, you can find those in San Antonio. The one in the middle I think is so creative. Somebody made a skull out of pan, out of bread. And then now what's so popular are those decorated cookies that every bakery in town has. And so the very simple bread is the one on the left, which is just a glob of yeast bread. The one in the middle just has what? A head. And then the one on the right has the skulls and the head and a beautiful glaze on it. It's delicious bread. Even though if you translate pan dulce, it translates to what? Sweet bread. Hmm, well the French will say. French sweet breads are something else, right? But pan dulce is really not very sweet. So that's a neat part of pan dulce. It doesn't have all that sugar. So you can also, like I said, request a pan de muertos in your own image. And so what is the menu, the Dia de Muertos? Tamales. What do you see in the picture? Huh? You see mole, right? And you see chocolate. So you see a lot of sweets and the solid foods. And so there is a different menu that people make. On Thursday, Thursday that's tomorrow. Oh, bah. I'm having a dinner party and I'm making mole that's going to be hard to make. So what do you drink? With pan de muertos? No. Atole. Huh? Atole. Atole. Okay, I'm going to confess. I don't like atole. It's like eating watered down oatmeal in my book. It's milk with cinnamon and so forth, but it is kind of thick. It's made with a corn flour. But you also you have atole or you have chocolate or you have coffee, of course. And uh, the one on the right is my granddaughter's favorite ones because they're the little pescaditos. So the beauty of pan dulce is that it comes in many shapes with many names, some of them as funny as can be. Hey, you know where I went in March? Where did I go in March? Tanizo, the home of who? Of Coco. So this is in the state of Morelia, I mean Michoacan, and near the city of Morelia. And there's a real Mama Coco. A real Mama Coco. How old do you think Mama Coco is? Oh, she looks old, doesn't she? So how old do you think she is? 
Uh, a little bit more. A little bit more. 105. She's 105 years old, and that woman is alert. So I asked her, I sat and of course interviewed her and talked to her. I said, well, um, I thought it was a, an indelicate question. I asked her if she'd been married, and she said, oh yes, many times. <laughs> and I said, really? She said, I said, well, who, who was your first husband? And so she told me the name of her first husband, and I said, um, you know, what was he like? Oh, he was wonderful, and he was this, and he was tall, and he was, she described him in detail. So she married him when she was 19. So we're talking, have I already gone 20 minutes? Oh my goodness, okay. Oh, well, 18, not 17, it was good, two minutes. Anyway, her, I said, who was your last husband? And she told me who he was, and then I asked her, well, who is, your, who is a middle husband? And she said, oh, I don't remember his name. So she remembered the first one and the last one. I said, which one was your first one? And she said, the, I mean, who was her favorite one? The first one, because he was her, the, the love of her life. And the last one was because he was the last husband. And then she said, he was the last one I had sex with. <laughs> Okay, that's in the interview officially. Shall I publish it? Probably so, it makes it kind of interesting. So anyway, there I am with my granddaughter, who sometimes has purple hair, sometimes red hair, green hair, whatever it is. She's in high school. That's at, their, at, at Mama Coco's house. Wonderful interview to find out who she was. And she sits there every day for people to come visit. And yes, Walt Disney, paid her money. Because I know that if you've been reading Facebook, it says that they didn't treat her right. According to her, they treated her very well. So, what is Dia de Muertos today? 3,000 years later, it's alive and well. Because people die every day. And every day we cry for those that left us. And every day we remember those that we love the most. And so it's really a very official kind of a day. Um, there's, there's us on Saturday night. This past Saturday, my granddaughter, Erica, who is at MIT and is gonna be a nuclear fusion engineer. She's getting her PhD, that's the one with the little flowers right here. And she's dressed up like who? Frida Kahlo, right? And there she is on the other side with her boyfriend dressed up like Diego Rivera, right? I mean, and in the middle is, is my daughter, Judy, who is the mother of Erica. And there's my little granddaughter that had the, before she dyed her hair, her hair blonde, or blue or green or red, and with her favorite pan de muertos, which is a simple one, and it just has the sugar up on top. And here's the recipe. You can make pan de muertos at home, okay? And it's absolutely delicious. And there's a YouTube that you can watch with me making pan, pan dulce at my house with a young man, 15 years old, who blew me away. Because that kid figured out all sorts of mixing methods and so forth, and to also going to be an engineer at 15, he already knows that he's a dude, how to augment the process of making pan de muertos. So you'll have a chance to see the videotape, and I made it in 20 minutes, right? Gracias. Remember your loved ones. Say their names out loud. Shout them out. And if you don't know all their names, or your great-grandmother, your great-great-great-grandmother, call your mother, or your father, or your aunt, or your uncles, and find out the full names of everybody. Because that really is what Dia de Muertos is about. And that's me in my costume I wore on Saturday night. I don't paint my face because I sweat too much. So that's why I get to wear one that just hides my face. Thank you very, very much. We've got about 10 minutes for questions. Um, we have both of our fabulous speakers. Can we give them both just a round of applause? Thank you so much. Thank you so 
much, both of you. So who's got some questions for our experts here about Dia de Muertos? Or Pan de Muertos or anything. Oldest person, or which is the, the late, the oldest generation that somebody remembers the name of your grandmother or great grandmother or great grand uncle or who? Who's the oldest? Great. Does anybody remember a great great grandmother? Okay. What's her name? Very nice. Who, does anybody remember a great, great, great grandmother? Uh, yes, I remember at least um, 10 or 12. 10 or 12 at least. Wow, wonderful. Excellent. Because I'm from Saudi Arabia. You're from what? I'm from Saudi. Uh huh. From so, and so you really keep track of who, yeah, who we all have the, to of the ancestors <laughs> are. Um, I don't know if you know, but if you go back, and you count for everybody, you would come out, you would have over 2,000, what do you call it, 2,000 ancestors. And at least the tradition I'm from, you don't have to remember their names to pay honor to your uh, dead ones. Don't, if, even if you don't recognize their names or, or whatever you know, their real grandparents, a simple thought, it's what brings them back. They will always come back. I, I would remember, being a little girl and like waiting for them because <laughs> I wanted to feel them. Of course you don't see them, they're not ghosts. You, you will have to not think about Halloween and the ghosts coming and whatever. It can be as simple as a swift of wind when you walk or a flower falls and it's the right color or whatever it is that remind, reminds you of that. And like you know, a lot of our records got lost or got burnt. Uh, we can't keep track of who, where we come from really. Uh, and at least in my family, there is a history that one of my great grandmas picked up kids that were orphans and never told anybody who were the real kids and not. And so genealogy doesn't work even if the records were kept. But don't you worry if you don't have a picture or you don't have the names, you have them in your heart and that's what counts. But we do have Ancestry.com and you can find <laughs> everybody that goes before you. I also told said I was going to tell you about calendar of events. So on Friday night, for the very first time ever, Javier Ruiz Galindo, the guy who started the one in Mexico City, and the one in Moscow, the one in Paris, and in Poland, is doing a huge celebration in San Antonio, along with every other cultural arts organization in town. So Friday night, the very first river parade of Catrinas. And so the barges are all decorated. The Grand Marshal was just announced today. It's Eva Longoria. And there's going to be dancing and so forth. It's a free parade. Right there is La Villita, where there'll be a lot of altares, like there were on Sunday that were at Hemisphere. And that will be open and also will, will be free. We're putting up, let's say we, my, my colleague and I, Kathy Sosa and I, are doing um, an altar for victims of domestic violence. And then we were asked to do one at San Fernando Cathedral. So there, there'll be also some altares, another one for victims of domestic violence. And um, we're, we're going to do a candlelight procession from, from San Fernando Cathedral all the way to La Vida. So los invito que vengan a celebrar who you are. Ooh. Yeah, and well, just a reminder, Friday, <laughs> I also perform, and we have the Guadalupe Company. Uh, the Guadalupe, that's another festivity. And uh, in on campus, if you don't feel like making another on your dorm, although there is papel picado, so please be sure to grab one and take one. Um, it has rowdy on it. Um, <laughs> You feel free to come to the BBL office. It's on the third floor at the main building. And we put our altar so you can bring your pictures or you can be, bring foods. Uh, one thing that I don't know that I mentioned or not, but um, the food has to be not what we like. I mean, of course, we'll put what we like because we want to eat it. But um, we put 
what our ancestors or the people who died liked and things that remember, you know, remind us of them. So if I had an aunt, for example, that died and, and she liked, I don't know. Why is it I have to? There you go, some tequila and, or something. You know, that's what you put. And, and so you can bring that to the altar in BBL. And it, it is a community altar for UTSA students. So if you don't feel like, you know, going downtown because it's too much people or you have too much homework, uh, you can just go to the main building and, and see the decorations there. And as a special surprise or very kind gift, Dr. Clark brought us Pandemago in the back. Um, so what we're going to do, yes, the conchas are in the back, we cut them up. Um, so, so what we're going to do now is we're um, going to kind of switch to get ready. Now that we have all this wonderful information, those of you who have seen Coco before, I know you're going to see something different. And those of you who have not seen Coco before, you're going to have an enhanced viewing because of everything you just learned. So we're going, it's going to take a couple of minutes for us to switch over to Coco. Please go ahead and have some photos in the back. Also, make sure your hands are clean, but you can come over here. You can see what we have for special collections. Um, we do have the zines in the back for Dia de Mapos. We also have um, all of these surveys, and this helps us to know what we should do, how we did do, and all of those things. So this is your opportunity to go to the restroom, do all those things. We've got about five minutes, and then we're going to start Coco. Again, many, many thank yous to our wonderful, wonderful professors. Thank you.